Colossians chapter 4. We are getting toward the end of this short letter to the Colossian church and getting into Paul's greetings of various individuals. And I have found my study of this to be just a real personal blessing to me, and I hope it will be to you tonight. We're going to read two verses in uh, chapter 4, Colossians 4, verse 10 and 11, and then we'll look at these men of comfort is what we are titling this message tonight, Colossians 4, 10 and 11. Let's read those verses. It says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Let's ask the Lord to open our eyes tonight to his truth here. Lord, we thank you for this evening. Thank you that we can look at your word together tonight. Thank you for the power that is packed into these two short little verses for the lives that are represented here of faithfulness, service to you. Lord, inspire us, encourage us, convict us, however you need to work in our lives. We ask that you would do that this evening. Empower me, Lord, as I speak. Help me to make clear these passages. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Crying children generally run to either their mother or their father for comfort. Which is it generally? Mom, it's Mother's Day, and we are honoring our mothers, um, and it's appropriate that we notice that. But they generally, when they get hurt, when they run into something, when they hurt themselves, they go to mothers for their comfort. The father can do his best. He He can do whatever he will to comfort them. He can pat them on the back and rub their back and talk to them. Is it okay? I'm sorry and all of this. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Are you in need? There, she has, he has the little child laughing practically by the time he's done, but as soon as the child leaves him and mom's there, the cries and the tears come again sometimes, and it's all over because the child knows they can get more mileage out of it that way, I think. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, children are drawn to their mothers instead of their fathers. Um, Men are not generally as comforting as women. I say that carefully, but um, ladies are generally the ones that, that are comforting as far as children go. But Paul was not a child. But look at what he says about these two, three men. What does he say about these men? They have proved, at the end of verse 11, they have proved to be what? A comfort to me. He's comforted by these men, by Aristarchus, by Mark, and by Jesus or Justice. He'll go by Justice tonight. Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice had proved to be a comfort to Mark or to Paul. And the word comfort here is interesting as I studied this word and some of the resources I looked at said this means, this word comfort means consolation, solace. And this was interesting. He said, consolation or solace using more than just words. It's more than your words that are a comfort. Another resource defined it as help or assistance. So these men are a comfort, and we think of comfort as they're there, you know, it's not so bad, you know, everything's going to be okay. It's more than that. It's, It's consolation. It's solace. It's more than just words. It's their help their assistance. These men had undoubtedly spoke words of comfort to Paul. They had said nice things to him. Yet there was something more about even their presence with him that was a comfort. Their physical ministry was a comfort to him. We read later on, we'll get into this later, but Luke, the the beloved physician, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. What do you think Luke, the beloved physician, did for Paul, who had gotten beaten like tons of times. Um, He probably tended to him physically. These other men probably ran messages. They probably did a number of 
physical things to assist Paul. Their physical ministry was a comfort for him. But I would go a step further and say that their testimonies and their faithfulness over a period of time made even their presence a comfort to him. Just the fact that Aristarchus was sitting there with Paul was a comfort, proved to be a comfort. Just the fact that Mark was there was a comfort to Paul. Just the fact that Justice was sitting there with Paul was a comfort to him. Have you ever found this to be so that just someone being there is a comfort to you, especially someone that is that you appreciate and you know, you know their character. Several years ago, we were um, out here at um, Bowman Woods School. We were on the playground and kids were playing and Tori fell off of something and broke his arm. And I remember it was the first, I think, broken bone in our family, the first of many. But uh, he broke his arm. And I remember seeing that curve of his arm that wasn't supposed to be there and we went down to the hospital and um, when we arrived at the hospital we were weighing in weighing him in there at the uh, the entryway to the emergency room and lo and behold who should be there but Josh Pruitt and he comes into the he comes into that little room and he said I'll take him (laughs) and that was a comfort to me because I knew Josh Pruitt. I know Josh Pruitt, and I appreciate uh, his character. He's a friend, and it it was a comfort just to have him there. We were in the room later on getting his arms set, getting ready to get his arms set, and Pastor and Mrs. Hamilton walked in the room, and I hadn't asked them to come, but they just showed up, and my heart was just uh, strengthened by that, because I know them. They're like a second set of parents to me, and and I was comforted not only by them being there, but by their friendship and knowing their character. And this is, I think, the sense of comfort that Paul has. That these men are just sitting here. I know these men. There is faithfulness packed into every single life of these men. And they prove to be a comfort to me. These three men are all converted Jewish men. He, he distinguishes them in verse 11. These are my only fellow workers. Now that's not true because Luke's sitting there and Demas. Luke was not a Jewish man though. Jewish by nationality. He said, these men are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision, meaning they're Jewish men. They were converted Jewish men. And my question here for us tonight is what made these three converted Jews of such comfort comfort to to Paul. And as we study their lives, if you just take their lives and look at all the instances of their names being mentioned, there's not many instances, but if you put those instances together, you have a really powerful picture that is a great encouragement, I believe, to us. This first man he mentions in verse 10 is Aristarchus. Aristarchus. As you study the life of Aristarchus, I think we could summarize his life in these three words, persistence and suffering. Persistence and suffering. Aristarchus was probably one of Paul's disciples. Paul discipled people. He discipled Timothy. He discipled Titus. And he was probably discipling Aristarchus. The word Aristarchus means the best ruler. How would you like to have that name in Sunday school? The best ruler. Um, in school, but uh, that was Aristarchus. He was from Macedonia, Acts 19.29 tells us. And Paul had possibly met him on his second missionary journey. This is when he heard the Macedonian call. There was a, a dream that he had, and he saw a man from Macedonia standing there, and the man said to him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And Paul crossed the body of water there and went into Greece and Macedonia and began to evangelize that area being called there from the Lord. And one of the people that he may have reached during that time was this man Aristarchus. Paul's practice was to go to the Jews first. And if you study this pattern through the book of Acts, we won't take the time to do this, but if you were to start at Paul's beginning of his missionary journey, Time after time after time, in every city he went to, he went to the synagogue. Why did he go to the synagogue? Because the Jewish people were at the synagogue. You would find Jewish people at the synagogue. 
And he would reason with the Jewish people for a certain amount of time until they either accepted the gospel or rejected it. And then after that, he would say something like, you've rejected this, I now turn to the Gentiles. And he would evangelize the Gentiles. Then he would go to the next city and he would go to the synagogue. And he would go to the synagogue and find some more Jews and give them the gospel. So much so that in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the Macedonian. And so he goes to the Jewish people first. And he evangelized them and Likely at one of those stops, he reached a man named Aristarchus. I want you to go to Acts 19, if you would. We're going to do a little bit of turning tonight. And I want you to see in Acts 19, we're just punching in. I'll get the context in just a minute. But I want you to note how Aristarchus is identified in this verse. So the whole city was filled with confusion. We're in Ephesus right now. And rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius, and here's our man, Aristarchus, Macedonians. And what does it say they were? They were, they were Paul's travel companions. He is identified as Paul's traveling companion. Now, Paul had been teaching in Ephesus likely at this stage, for over two years. And before Ephesus, he had been ministering in Galatia and Phrygia, that's modern-day Turkey. And he had not been to Macedonia for some time. It appears that Aristarchus, when he was converted, potentially in Macedonia, we don't know this for sure, but when he was converted, he became Paul's traveling companion, and he just... He hung out with Paul wherever Paul went. And this was the nature of Paul's nurturing Aristarchus. He, again, study, if you study the chronology here, um, to say that he's Paul's traveling companion, uh, it doesn't really, you don't really get the context. But when you consider that Paul had been here for a couple of years, I mean, he's not been, literally been traveling. Maybe he's taken some short trips here and there. But he... Aristarchus, and we'll see later in his life, he traveled with Paul. I mean, he was everywhere with Paul. He went to Jerusalem. Uh, he went back to Rome with Paul. He's in, in Rome with Paul right now as Paul writes this letter. Aristarchus went where Paul went. Um, we'll see that in a little bit. But he's, he's with Paul. Now, why is he with Paul? Did Paul hire him as his personal secretary, his, you know, his minister? No, I believe Paul took these men along and he was just discipling him discipling these men. And this is the nature of biblical discipleship. As I just considered this for a little bit, that's what discipleship is. I don't think Paul had necessarily a program that he was working through with this person. I think he was just intentionally sharing his lifestyle and walk with the Lord with someone in an informal setting. You know, we're going here, oh, these guys cursed Paul out. You know, what is, how does Paul respond to when people curse him out? You know, that's not necessarily planned into a discipleship lesson. Uh, oh, they beat him here. What is, they beat me. Okay, they, Aristarchus suffered with Paul. We'll get into that in a little bit. But as he, as he is with Paul in these informal settings, he sees Paul's life. Can you think of anybody else that did it that way? Discipled just by hanging out with, all the, I don't know, 12 men for the period of about three and a half years. Jesus lived with these 12 men. He listened to them argue. He listened to them fight over who was the greatest. It sounds like, sounds like little kids. But he lived with these men and he trained them and they saw him sleep. They had to wake him up in the middle of a storm. Jesus, I mean, we're dying. Can you please wake up? They're, they're, he, they saw him walking on the water. They saw him hungry. They saw him tired. They saw all of these things. And that's what discipleship is. And I think sometimes we can get into this mode of there's this cleaned up version of my life that I present to others. But I don't know that that was the case with Paul. I think 
Paul presented himself and his life was just, I live with Jesus. I live with the Lord. Could we, could you and I do that? As I considered that, I thought, man, I, I need to be more like that. I need to be able to show my entire life. My life needs to be a discipleship of my children, of those that I come in contact with. There ought not be anything that I have to hide um, from, from people. Our lives are, are lived for the purpose of glorifying God. Even when we sin, I'm not saying, we, I mean, I know we're going to sin. We disciple other people. But how do you, how do you respond to sin? Do they, they need to see how do you respond when you sin against God. And I believe that that was Paul's method with Aristarchus. And Aristarchus was a traveling companion, probably a disciple of Paul. But Paul calls Aristarchus in this passage back in Colossians 4.10. He says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. He's my fellow prisoner. He was not necessarily chained as Paul was, but he might as well have been chained as Paul was. Hebrews 13.3 says, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Aristarchus was with Paul, and Paul says, he's my fellow prisoner. That doesn't really ring true until I tell you the next point, though. Aristarchus was no stranger to suffering with Paul. And this is what I found fascinating. As you study Aristarchus's life, Paul really, as he calls him my fellow prisoner, he meant it. Go to, you're in, you may be in Acts 19 still, go to verse 23. Paul has been preaching in Ephesus so much so for the space of two years that all those in Asia heard the word of the Lord. And these men get jealous of this fame and Paul is basically tearing down their economy there because everyone in Ephesus worships Diana. And these, little guy, these guys made little statues of the goddess Diana and they sold them for a profit. And nobody's believing in Diana anymore. Nobody wants a statue of Diana. And they said, we need to, I mean, we got to have some team spirit here, guys. I mean, Diana's great, great as Diana of the Ephesians. And they have this little pep rally thing starting. And Verse 23, we'll pick up there. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. That's what Christianity was referred to sometimes, the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed from all Asia and the world worship, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they just keep, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater, the amphitheater there, outdoor theater at Ephesus, with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. And some of the officials of Asia who were his friends sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Paul's friends literally held him back, likely, from addressing this riot. Why? They were afraid he would be torn to pieces, probably. But who's in the middle of it? Who had they already gotten? Aristarchus. He's in there somewhere. He's he's in there getting passed around 
you know, punching bag. I don't know what they were doing to him. But Aristarchus is in the middle of that. What do you think? I mean, put yourself in his sandals, I guess. How would you feel? I mean, you go down to one of these riots in a major city that are happening sometimes in our day. You're in the middle of that, and you're the reason they're rioting. They find out that you're a Christian. They find out that you're whatever. How do you feel? What, are, what emotions go through your mind? You think Aristarchus expected to be injured, killed, as these people scream, greatest Diana of the Ephesians? It says they seized him, they laid hands on him. So he's in the middle of this mob, and eventually, miraculously, he is able to escape. He's able to, the mob dies down, the town clerk comes in and quiets the crowd, and evidently they turn Aristarchus loose, and everything resumes. And Aristarchus ends up leaving Ephesus and accompanies Paul all over Macedonia again and all the way to Jerusalem. It says in, go to chapter 20, look at verse 1. Acts 20, verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, this is at Ephesus, and embraced them and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. So here's Aristarchus again. He's with Paul. He's in Macedonia now. And what's happening there? The Jews are plotting to kill Paul. And there's this conflict going on. And Aristarchus is continually ministering with Paul, watching, observing, assisting, being involved here, traveling with Paul. Traveling toward Jerusalem, he also is with Paul as he stops temporarily at Miletus. We looked at this last time, uh, verses 13 through 25. I'm not going to read them again, but you'll remember that after, so you think of Ephesus. Ephesus is where this uproar happened. All these people screaming for two hours, great as Diana of the Ephesians. Paul leaves, takes Aristarchus, goes to Greece, travels around here, exhorts the exhorts the churches, gets his life threatened again, comes back, decides, I need to go to Jerusalem. And as he passes by Asia, as he passes by Ephesus, he decides, I'm just going to call the elders of the church out. We're going to meet on Miletus, and I'm just going to keep on traveling uh, towards Jerusalem. And he does so, and he gives them this solemn charge in verses 13 through 35. But I want you to look again in verses 22 through 24. And he tells the elders at Miletus this, and this is probably on the shore somewhere. This is maybe inland a little bit, but this is close to the ship likely at Miletus. Paul's just stopped off. And Aristarchus, picture Aristarchus standing there with Paul on the shore. And Paul is telling these elders These words in verse 22. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Now, don't miss the import of those words. What was the Holy Spirit saying in every city where they stopped? Some prophet would come up to Paul and say, chains and imprisonment await you at, your next, at, at Jerusalem. Chains and imprisonment await you at Jerusalem. Hey, Paul, I have a message for you. Welcome to the city, but here's, our me- here's your message. Chains and imprisonment await you at Jerusalem. Goes to the next city. Prophet taps him on the shoulder after the service during the piano's playing, and he says, you know, I have a message for you from the Lord. Chains and imprisonment await you at Jerusalem. Thank you, Paul says. I've heard that several times now. You know who else hears that? Aristarchus. 
Aristarchus, does he leave? What would you think? You're, you're with somebody and we're headed to Jerusalem and what's the itinerary? Well, we're going to get chained up and imprisoned. Does Aristarchus go anywhere? Goes with Paul, persistent in the face of suffering. I think he had determined to be like this man who was mentoring him. You go to Jerusalem, verse, uh, chapter 21, you can see. Uh, just look at two verses here. Chapter 21, verse 30, Acts 21, 30. Paul is in Jerusalem. And these people accuse him of bringing a Gentile into the temple, which he did not do. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. I would imagine that Aristarchus was not far away, maybe in the middle of that one as well. Here's another mob trying to kill his mentor. You have several more chapters, Acts 21 through 27. Acts 21 through 27, Paul is in Jerusalem or Caesarea in prison over two, over two years. You know who stayed with him? Aristarchus. He likely ministered to Paul during his imprisonments and trials in those two cities. What did he do? Probably carrying communications, maybe purchasing necessities, just talking with Paul. But he's with him because in chapter 27, verse 1, go to 27, 1. Remember, 21 through 27, we've not read those chapters. We're not going to read those chapters. But during those chapters, all that you have are the accounts of Paul's trials before Felix, Festus, Herod Agrippa, Paul's defending the faith. Aristarchus likely hears some of those defenses. That's all that's happening. Paul appeals to Caesar and um, he's told, have you appealed to Caesar? I'll send you to Caesar. And he's on his way to, to see, to be tried before Caesar. Chapter 27, verse 1. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. <clears throat> So entering a ship of Adramitium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coasts of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. Aristarchus was still in Jerusalem, still with Paul, still being discipled, still persistent. What do you know about this voyage? It's like getting on the Titanic. I mean, would you get on? Um, he, he's boarding this doomed ship. He didn't know it was doomed, but he's boarding this doomed ship on which Paul sailed most of the way to Rome. Look in chapter 27, look at verse 13. Just the account of this storm here. I want to point out something. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that we had obtained that they had obtained their desire, this is they're under the island of Crete. Paul told them, You should stay here. You really should stay here. They said, No, we want to keep going. Uh, but they, they sailed close by Crete, but not long after a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurocladon. This is a northeast wind that's driving them, uh, interestingly enough, down towards the sands of Egypt, which was sort of the graveyard of ships. And they were scared about hitting uh, this island there. there um, they mentioned this, the Sirtis Sands in verse 17. They're scared of this uh, running aground in the Sirtis Sands down there on that north coast of Africa. Verse 18 and because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. <clears throat> Who's throwing the stuff overboard with Paul? Aristarchus. Okay, The man's been through a lot. He's gotten yanked into the theater at Ephesus. He's probably watched the mob at Jerusalem. He's seen Paul tried. He's now on this ship in the middle of the storm, and he's throwing the cargo out with Paul. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. I mean, that's bad. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have been in a situation like that before um, where you have lost hope of surviving. 
that I'm probably going to die in the next few minutes. This is the end. And you begin to mentally tick off your things that you want to think through before you die. And, and you're starting to prepare yourself to meet the Lord. And, and you're thinking about things. And all hope that you're going to be saved is lost. It's gone. I mean, the plane's going down. There's, there's no hope. This is what Aristarchus is facing. He's staring death in the face for I don't know how many times now. But he's staring death in the face. There's no hope that he's going to be saved. And he, I wonder, had he, had he had these thoughts in the mob at Ephesus as well? You know, as these people are screaming, had he lost hope that he was going to make it out alive? But he does. He floats to shore from the shipwreck, likely clinging to a piece of wood. And, you know, as he feels the sand beneath his feet and he walks up on the shore and he pushes the wood aside, he says, where in the world are we now? <laughs> he watches Paul get bit by a snake. It's like, Oh boy, here's the end for Paul. Paul shakes the snake off into the fire and they get another ship and they keep on sailing. And now here he is in Rome. And Paul looks over as he, write, as he writes this letter. And he looks at Aristarchus. And what does he call him? My fellow prisoner. <laughs> Very appropriate. Very appropriate for a man like Aristarchus. He had faced death with Paul numerous times. And his very presence sitting there, maybe on the floor, was a comfort to the apostle. Not to mention his words and actions. When Aristarchus spoke, Paul probably listened. Aristarchus was a man of persistence. He stared death in the face several times. And he didn't back down from his faith, from his duty. He wanted to be where Paul was, where the action was. We know from the next man we're going to study that Paul did not look favorably to people giving up in the midst of difficulties. Paul taught, evidently, he probably talked about this with his disciples. You stick with it. We don't stop. We don't give up. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. None of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear unto myself. These are, these are Paul's mentality. That's Paul's mentality. And he is telling these things to Aristarchus. And Aristarchus heeds these words. And he persists. And like Paul, he didn't count his life dear to himself. Persistence in the face of difficulty, in the face of suffering... John McCain, before he passed away, told this story of his time in Vietnam. He was in a POW camp. He was a pilot that was shot down and captured, evidently, and taken to this POW camp in, I believe, Hanoi, Vietnam. A fellow prisoner in the fellow American prisoner in that POW camp began to take the threads of various materials and stitch into the inside of his uniform an American flag. They were very depressed in that prison. And this American stitched into the, si into the inside of his uniform the American flag. And when he finished it, he opened it so that they could see it. And he said, say it. And they said, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. He said the Pledge of Allegiance. The Viet Cong came, came and they beat that soldier mercilessly. Took away his uniform, dumped him back in the cell. He looked over at him. And over that period of time, he began to stitch that flag back into that new uniform. When he finished it, he looked at them and he said, say it. Persistence. Now, if he can do that for the United States, which is a noble cause, and I praise God for men and women like that all over our nation. That's why we are who we are today, partially, because God has given us faithful men and women who, like that who are persistent, who are patriots. If they can do it for a, a place like America, can you do it for a place like heaven? I've never been there, but I've heard a lot about it. Can you do it for a place for a person like Jesus? Can you be persistent? Paul could. 
Aristarchus could. They, they were looking not at this earthly place, not at these sufferings of this present time. Paul wrote about this in the, in the book of Romans. We, these, these things are, are light afflictions, actually, first, uh, wherever it is, 2 Corinthians. These are light afflictions. They work for us at a far more eternal weight of glory. We don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's what he said, for this cause we, we faint not. We don't give up. May God give us more men and women like Aristarchus. I wonder, do we count our life too dear to give to the Lord? Is there something that you really hope to do before you die? That you're not willing to, to surrender to the Lord? Do we count our life too dear to give to the Lord? Paul said, I don't count my life dear to myself. I just want to finish my course. When the time comes, it's a pleasure to die for the Lord. But that only happens if it's a pleasure to live for Him. I've asked this, you've asked this probably yourself. Will I, would I be able to die for the Lord? Somebody came up and they were threatening my life if I would not renounce my Christian faith. Would I be able to die for the Lord? And the, the answer to that is God gives you grace for what you need in the time that you need it. But another answer to that is it's difficult to die for the Lord if you don't live for the Lord. I think it's going to be difficult to die for the Lord if you don't live for the Lord. Something that's been in my heart multiple times. If, I'm, if I want to die for the Lord, be willing to die for the Lord, I had better take care that I live for the Lord. You say, well, what if I've failed the Lord? What if I'm not persistent? What if I've already just cratered, already failed? Well, the next man is for you. The next man is for me if we've done that. Let's look at the next man in this list. We've talked about Aristarchus, persistence and suffering. Mark is the next one. You summarize Mark's life, triumph after failure. Triumph after failure. Mark was a man of amazing connections. It says in Colossians 4.10, And Mark, sister's son to Barnabas, or cousin to Barnabas. How would you like to be Barnabas' cousin? Barnabas, who was nicknamed, this was not his real name, Barnabas is the name they gave him, means son of consolation, son of comfort. How would you like to be his cousin? Hang out with him all the time. That was Mark, cousin to Barnabas. Peter, in 2 Peter, is going to call Mark his son. How would you like the apostle Peter to say, he's my son? He's not his son, but he is in a way. He's like his second father. How would you like the Apostle Paul to send for you in his deepest need? At his death, on death's door, he sends for you. And he says in 2 Timothy 4, Take Mark and bring him with you, for he's profitable to me for the ministry. That was this man, Mark. He wrote a gospel. One of the gospels in our Bible is the gospel of Mark. This is the same man. Likely in consultation with Peter. That was Mark. He was connected closely with Barnabas, cousin. Peter would call him his son. Paul would say, he's profitable to me for the ministry. I need him right now. Go, go get Mark. I need Mark. He would write one of the Gospels of our Bible. A man of amazing connections. But Mark, secondly, struggled with persistence. Go to Acts chapter 12. Acts 12. And look at verse 12. Peter has just gotten, gotten um, broken out of jail here by the angel. Actually, he didn't break him out. He just opened the gate. And Peter walks out of the gate. And he comes to himself. He thought he was dreaming, but he comes to himself. He realizes he's, out in the, he's outside the, the jail and he's awake. It's not a dream. Verse, two, verse 12, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. That's our man. Where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked, the door, knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And you have the story here of 
I'm telling these believers that their prayers are answered. They can hardly believe it. They don't believe it at first. They tell Rhoda she's mad. She's insane. We're praying for Peter. He's in jail. Why would Peter be at the gate? Um, that's the sense here. But who is there? Probably. We don't know this for sure, but this is Mark's house. You think Mark was there that night? I believe he was probably praying with these people. And he sees, maybe he sees Peter in answer to prayer, walk in that room, and everybody goes nuts. Peter's, it says that Peter had to, shh, 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 guys, be quiet, be quiet. He beckons him with the hand to be quiet so that the whole city doesn't wake up. And, and he tells them how the Lord had delivered him. And Mark sees this. He witnesses Peter's deliverance. Maybe that deliverance impacted his faith and drew the attention of Barnabas, his cousin, because we see right after this, chapter 12, verse 25, look down in verse 25. Paul and Barnabas had come to Jerusalem to deliver this gift that was taken from the churches, that was taken by the churches for the church at Jerusalem because of a great famine that was occurring in that, at that time. And Barnabas and Saul, verse 25, returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. And maybe Barnabas, in talking with his cousin, said, you know what, I see something in you, and I want you to come with us. We're going, we're going up to Antioch, and they go back up to Antioch, and they're there for some time, and they're ministering in that church. Now in the church, they were at Antioch, verse, chapter 13, verse 1, there were certain prophets and teachers, and it gives them... Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. They, having fasted and prayed, laid their hands on them. They sent them away. So being set out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. So John goes from Jerusalem to Antioch, and then he goes with Barnabas and Paul on their first missionary journey. And he watched Paul probably rebuke Elymas the sorcerer at Cyprus at this uh, location they were at. When they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bargesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, that is, the proconsul did. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so his name was translated, withstood them, seeking to turn away the proconsul away from the faith. He's a sorcerer, probably some witchcraft and some other things going on here. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what he had done being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Mark probably witnessed that at this time. But then you see, when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, verse 13, let, returned to Jerusalem. So he traveled with them and then abruptly left them. Maybe he had not traveled farther than this, in his life, and he was afraid of the unknown. Barnabas was a native of Cyprus, so maybe John Mark had been here before. Perhaps the encounter with Elymas' sorcery and witchcraft had shaken him. But Paul describes his actions in chapter 15. If we turn over there, two verses in chapter 15, I want you to see. Chapter 15, verse 38. Tell me how Paul describes his actions. Somebody pick it out. What did Paul say about him? Verse 38. Everybody there? Didn't want to take him with them. 
Why? Last part of the verse. Departed from the work. He had not gone with them to the work. There was work to be done, and John Mark left. Didn't go with them to the work. Paul was offended enough by this that it caused a sharp dissension. Verse 39, then the contention between the t- contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. Paul was willing to part friendship with Barnabas. I mean, that's saying something. Paul was saying, I will not, I will not have this man. He's not going to come. He's deeply offended, deeply hurt by this. And Barnabas takes Mark, and where does he go? He goes back to Cyprus. They start over at Cyprus. What a good pattern for witnessing and discipleship. Start with what's familiar. Paul took Silas, and he went away to Syria and Cilicia. But here you have Mark. We don't know the circumstances here. We don't know why he did this. I gave you some possibilities. But he decided, this is, I don't want this. And he drew back and he stopped and he left them and he left them in the lurch and it offended Paul. It was the cause of a division. But that's not all of the story. Mark was ultimately profitable in the service of the Lord. You know, there was somebody else who pulled back and said, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't know that man. He said it three times. That was Peter. Peter is going to call Mark my son. I wonder, it doesn't say this in Scripture, but I wonder if Peter had a talk with Mark. I wonder if he encouraged Mark and said, listen, that was not a good thing you did, but it's not over. It's not over. Because Mark evidently got things straightened out. And here in Rome, back in Colossians 4.11, Paul says, Mark... Cousin to Barnabas, if he, uh, about whom you receive commandments, if he comes to you, receive him, welcome him. He's commending him to the Colossians. He's not saying, you know, look out for this guy, Mark. He's just a, he's a freeloader and he likes to hang out and then he leaves you in the lurch. He's not saying that. And he's, he's commending him. If he comes to you, receive him, welcome him. He tells them that Mark's presence and service to Paul was a comfort And it might have been just a reminder to Paul of the power of God's grace to transform a fearful, timid life into a steadfast, persistent soldier of Christ. In 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul says, Take Mark and bring him with you, for he's profitable to me for the ministry. I said Mark would ultimately write a gospel, likely under Peter's direction. There was a man named Justin Martyr in early church history who referred to Mark's gospel as the memoirs of Peter. Just meaning that Mark collaborated with Peter and the Lord inspired him as he wrote Peter's account and maybe some of his own uh, research as Luke did, but wrote this gospel in collaboration with Peter possibly. In 1 Peter 5.13, the Apostle Peter would call Mark his son. Here's a man who's sitting next to Paul, and Paul looks at him. Paul had split with Barnabas over this man. He had been deeply offended at this man. We don't know the details of the reconciliation, but it had occurred. Mark had come to Paul, and he had said something like this. You know, sir, I want to I make good on my commitment to follow the Lord. I want to be with you. And here he is sitting next to Paul, and I wonder if Paul looks over at him, and he sees... Triumph after failure. And here's a man that his his very presence is an encouragement to Paul. Failure is not final. It wasn't for Mark and it's not for us. Think of what a useful man Mark turned out to be. The second gospel in our New Testament, one of the books of our New Testament, is because this man didn't quit. He didn't give up. He failed. I mean, he cratered. He There was... There was failure there, but he did not give up. He didn't stop. Are you struggling with failure in the past? Have you failed? We've all failed. Have you, is there a particular failure, though, that is dogging you? 
I mean, biting at your heels, trying to bring you down, trying to get you to give up. Failure is not final. Leave failure in the past. Don't carry it into the future. Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I'm not looking over here at the failures. I'm leaving those things in the past, forgetting things that are behind. What was behind in Paul's life? I mean, talk about failure. What was in the past? Friends, there were probably families, there were probably mothers and children that Paul had drug out of their houses and their Husbands, he had condemned to death. He had been instrumental in condemning these people to death. He had compelled people to blaspheme. I don't even know what all that entails, but maybe a sword at their, pointed at them and says, curse Christ. And he compelled these people to blaspheme. He gave his testimony against them. He says he was obsessive in his pursuit of these people. I mean, talk about a skeletons in the closet. I mean, here's a guy that's his past is rotten. And he said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, I reach forward to the high calling of God. I'm forgetting what's in the past. I'm pressing on towards what's in the future. There was a race called the Stoke on Trent. It's a quarter mile race in England. In July 1923, England saw something of the grit and determination of a Christian runner named Eric Little. At the first bend of this race, he tripped over the legs of the English runner J.J. Gillies, and he fell off the track. By the time he was back on his feet, the last of the other runners was 30 yards away, moving fast. But Little attacked them with such pace that he had finally overtook Gillies three yards from the line to win before collapsing, spent to the ground. The circumstances in which Little won the event made it a performance bordering on the miraculous, wrote the Scotsman. Veterans whose memories take them back 35 years, and in some cases even longer in the history of athletics, were unanimous in the opinion that Little's win in the quarter mile was the greatest ever track performance that they had ever seen. Here's a young man who said, I'm not giving up. Yes, I've fallen. Yes, I'm 30 yards away, but I'm not giving up. Now, he could do that for a corruptible crown. Can you do that for an incorruptible? Can we do that for an incorruptible? We've fallen. we failed. Maybe you failed this week. Are you going to lay there or are you going to get up? Failure's not final. Triumph after failure is this man, Mark. It's what he reminded Paul of. The third man we don't know a lot about, so he's not going to take very long. Justice. Fresh devotion. I think we could summarize his life. Justice probably had not known Paul very long. He may have been a converted Jew. If you go to Acts 28, You see that Paul goes to Rome finally. He arrives at Rome after the shipwrecks and everything that's happened. He finally arrives at Rome. And where do you think he goes as the evangelist that he is? The gospel is the power of God to the Jew first. So he calls the Jews together and he reasons with them about the gospel. Verse 24 gives us the outcome. Some were persuaded by the things which were spoken and some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet to our fathers. He gives them the quotation, verse 28, Therefore let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. But some of those Jews believed. could be that Justice was one of those Jewish people who believed. He is not greeted in Paul's letter to the Romans, which is saying something. If you go to Romans 16, it's like Paul thought of every single Roman that he could possibly think of. He'd never been to Rome, but he's heading there and he's trying to think of every single Roman he can think of and he lists them. 
He says, greet this person and greet this person and this person and this person. And if he had known justice, I think he would probably would have said, and greet justice. But he doesn't mention Jesus or justice. That Jesus was his original name. He doesn't greet him in his letter to the Romans. He's likely another disciple of Paul. And he's not mentioned in Philemon, which is significant. Philemon was a native of Colossae. So as they're reading the Colossians, remember that Onesimus is sitting down on the front row and he's helping um, um, Epaphras, um, or Tychicus, I'm sorry, he's helping Tychicus tell all of the news about Paul and in his hip pocket he has a letter for Philemon. And it's a personal letter about his condition. And Paul's writing personally to Philemon and he's going to talk to Philemon about um, setting Onesimus free. And he gives greetings from people that Philemon would know. He gives greetings from Aristarchus. We've noted Aristarchus. And uh, I believe a couple others. And he calls Aristarchus my fellow laborer there. But he doesn't mention justice. Why? Probably because Philemon doesn't know justice. Justice has not been traveling with Paul for a long time. And Paul did not, uh, so the, the others potentially did not know him. There's a chance that he had been recently converted or acquainted with Paul. He probably changed his name after conversion. Um, just the name Jesus, the Jewish name is the name Joshua. It would have been a common name, but for Christians it was a very special name. And perhaps he changed his name just to make room for that. And his presence with Paul reminded Paul that the gospel was still the power of God to everyone that believes. If justice had been recently converted, Paul could look at him and say, here's someone that's just believed. He's just getting started. The gospel still works, even at the end, potentially, of my life. It doesn't take years to become useful in the ministry. God can use you. God can use me right now. If you're a child here, you don't have all of the stories. You don't have all of the you know about the missionaries, you think, I could never do that. Oh, yes, you could. God can use you. God wants to use you. You know what God desires? All He desires is a heart that's given to Him. That doesn't prize video games, that doesn't prize the internet, that doesn't prize television and entertainment and cool stuff and having lots of money and all of these things. It doesn't prize those things over Him. It just prizes God. It doesn't count your life too dear to give to the Lord. God can use you. So here's these three men. Justice, Mark, Aristarchus. And we've learned from them. We need to ask God to make us persistent in the face of difficulties. I don't know if you were, some, most of us, I believe, were here for Monday's message of the missions conference. I was profoundly impacted by that message by Tim Berry. If you weren't able to be here, I'd encourage you to listen to that online. He said, look past the comfortable American dream of collecting things. That's what we do. We collect things. Houses, lands, cars, technology. We collect things. And preparing for retirement, we save. It's a good thing to save. But he said, look past all of that. Look to eternity. Don't look at the things that are temporal. Look to the things that are eternal. He said, wherever I, I am, for as long as I am, I must be the light of my world. I will never forget that. It's rhythmic even. It has some meter to it. You catch that? Wherever I am, for as long as I am, I must be the light of my world. Let's say it together. Ready? Wherever I am, for as long as I am, I must be the light of my world. We don't have to live, but we do have to be light. He used the illustration of the sea captain that said, we don't have to live, but we do have to sail. Persistence in the face of difficulties. Ask God to give you that. Ask God to work that deep within you. If you failed in that, if you've not been persistent, remember, failure is never final in the Christian life. 
You don't have to be a failure. I mean, here's John Mark. He's, he's a failure. Paul would not have him, didn't want this man. At the end of his life, he's written a gospel. He's faithful. He's called upon by Peter and Paul. He's ministered with Barnabas. Here's a man that's been faithful, even after failure. And the church needs fresh, young devotion. Young people, we need you. We are all getting old. <laughs> and we need young people that will stand for the gospel, who will tell their neighbors, who will tell their friends. What do you tell your friends? What do you talk to your friends about, young people? You say, I'm eight years old. What do you talk to your friends about? Do you talk about the Lord? If, if not, why not? Is the Lord important enough to talk about? Well, that's for stuff when I'm 13. And I get into the teens and I start witnessing or I do this or whatever. Witness to your friends. If God is important enough to save your soul, He's important enough to talk about. We need fresh, young devotion. May God encourage us from this. I was deeply encouraged by studying these three men. We're going to see them in heaven. And uh, we'll be able to talk about their ministries and the impact even that they've had upon us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for this, these testimonies of these men, men who are a comfort to Paul. I believe just by being there, just by him being able to look over and see them, they were a comfort to him. Lord, make us those type of men and women who just knowing one another, we can be comforted because of what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for the comfort that these people have been to me, to one another. Thank you for what you've used each of us to teach one another in these days. Lord, would you continue your ministry through us and in us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's turn to 584. 584 in your hymnal. Just thinking of that persistence. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. 584, let's stand together. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not, it must not suffer. together the strife will not be long stand up stand up for jesus the strife will not be long this day the noise of battle the next the victor song to him that overcometh a crown of life shall be King of glory shall reign eternally. Stand up for Jesus, soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not, it must not suffer. Missed.